Thank you very much for the introduction, Katarina. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about how to overcome two problems, uh, mode collapse and the curse of dimensionality. So mode collapse is, of course, a long-standing problem in GANs. Um, so I'm going to talk about that first. And then I'm going to talk about how to overcome the uh, curse of dimensionality in near neighbor search. And it turns out that those two topics are actually somehow connected. We'll find out exactly what, how. Um, OK. So first, let me give a brief overview of probabilist modeling. So why do we care about probabilist models? Right? So of course, the most popular class of models in use today are neural nets. They're great in that they're expressive, but they're just functions. So for any given input, uh, you can only have a unique output. So in other words, we can only produce a point estimate using a vanilla neural net. But the world is too complex to predict with complete certainty. So models that can't output their uncertainty, like neural nets, are really too restrictive for most applications. Now, there are two broad classes of probabilist models. So uh, the first is prescribed models, uh, and the second is implicit models. So, uh, and then there are also some methods that are in the intersection of the two. So let me talk about prescribed probabilist models first. Um, so these are just simply classical probabilist models um, that you know from uh, textbooks. Um, so these are defined by an explicit specification of the probability density. Um, so for example, you can think of a Markov random field um, as a classical example. And so um, now the key distinguishing characteristic is that you know exactly the mathematical form of the probability density, um, but then obviously you may not be able to evaluate the partition function, but at least you know, you know what that looks like. Um, and so the drawback is that there's a limited expressive power, right? So um, you know, if you add any higher order, general higher order potentials, for example, then um, you know, learning becomes computationally intractable. The second flavor of probabilist models are uh, uh, implicit probabilist models, and these have recently become very popular. Uh, and the reason why is because um, you can uh, essentially incorporate uh, neural net into the sampling procedure, right? So these are defined by the sampling procedure. So you don't necessarily know what the probability density actually looks like. Uh, you don't know the mathematical form or, or the in closed form. Um, but uh, you know, what you do know is how to actually sample from a distribution, right? So, you know, so for example, this is a standard uh, simple uh, sampling procedure that's used to define most implicit problems models. And so uh, f first step is you would sample some random vector z right, from a standard Gaussian. And then you would essentially feed that random vector right into a neural net uh, that's uh, denoted by t theta. And then you would uh, you know, treat the output y as a sample from the distribution that you're implicitly defining. And so uh, here, the probabilist, uh, probabilist model is really this model that gives you this distribution over the y's. OK, so how do we actually train implicit models? Um, so if we look at prescribed models, uh, they're uh, you know, more straightforward in the sense that um, you can train them using maximum likelihood or approximations thereof. Uh, however, for implicit probabilist models, it becomes trickier because the likelihood function cannot be expressed analytically or evaluated numerically. Uh, so you can't really maximize likelihood directly. And likelihood inference refers to this class of methods that can uh, give you primary estimates uh, without actually requiring you to know what the complete likelihood or any of the derived quantities are. Um, and so the general adversarial net, or GAN for sure, can be viewed as an example of a likelihood-free inference procedure. OK, so the GAN, of course, was introduced um, almost simultaneously by Goodfellow and uh, et al. and Gaumann et al. Uh, first one is much more well known. 
Um, so the intuition is that uh, we want generated samples to be indistinguishable from the real data. Um, and so uh, the, the, uh, the method is basically uh, you know, to introduce a classifier, which is called a discriminator. And we're going to train it to differentiate between model samples and the real data. Um, and the goal is to train the implicit probabilist model or the generator in the GAN parlance to fool the discriminator. Okay, so one of the most important problems in GANs is the problem mode collapse, and this is the problem where uh, essentially some or even most of the modes of the true data distribution can be actually unmodeled, right? So uh, we don't necessarily lear learn the true distribution, and so here's a, a pictorial example of you know, what could happen. So this uh, blue curve here represents the density of the true data distribution. The gold curve represents what your model could be actually learning, right? Which is to capture one of the modes of the true data distribution and completely ignoring this other one. Now, how serious is this problem? Now, it turns out that it's quite serious. Um, so this is a paper um, in, published in 2018 that did a large-scale empirical study of GANs. And they did uh, extensive hyperparameter tuning, um, and uh, and they found that even the best scan can actually drop 72 percent of the modes after extensive hyperparameter tuning. Um, and uh, interestingly, NS scan is actually referring to the original scan. Um, so the original scan is actually the one that actually achieves the greatest recall. The later improvements are actually achieving less recall. Question. Is it on the synthetic things? Like, is it a mixture of Gaussians kind of thing? Like, how do you this is on synthetic, yes. So this is actually on the synthetic data set of a manifold of triangles um, rendered, um, you know, in, uh, I think, uh, in uh, 64, 65, 64 resolution. Okay. And so this turns out to be a quite a challenging problem, and the community has struggled to uh, you know, tackle this problem, uh, and there have been many, many papers written on this topic. Um, you know, uh, 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 and some examples are shown here, um, and uh, you know, so it still uh, remains unsolved. So let's uh, actually take a look and see why mode collapse actually happens intuitively. So here's a simple illustration of a two-dimensional data set, right? So the red squares here represent uh, you know, instances of the data set. The blue circles represent generated samples. And so now let's uh, take a look at what again it essentially does. Um, and so I want you to, in particular, pay attention to how the blue circles move, right? So this essentially um, you know, shows you how the generated samples are actually going to move, right, when we uh, uh, train the model using the GAN objective. Okay, the first step in training a GAN is that we need to fit a discriminator, right? Um, in this case, for simplicity, we're going to uh, consider one nearest neighbor classifier discriminator, which gives you a decision boundary like this. Um, and so here, uh, the yellow regions are the, what, uh, the regions that the classifier thinks are real, the white regions are the regions where it thinks things are fake. And now after training the discriminator, we are going to train the generator, right? So the generator is essentially going to say, right, I want to uh, uh, have all these generated samples, right, being indistinguishable from the real data, right? So essentially that is going to push, right, all these generated samples, right, towards the yellow regions. So that is going to be what happens, right, after the first iteration. And now we're going to retrain the discriminator, right, so we're going to you know, have a new decision boundary, right, that again separates the blue circles from the red squares. And then we're going to push, right, all these blue circles again towards the yellow regions. And so that is going to be what happens next. Now, if you'll notice, there are these red squares at the top uh, right corner, right? These are not covered by any of the blue circles, right? So these are essentially the modes that are being dropped, right, by our model. Now, what actually went wrong in this case, right? So let's think back um, and uh, think about how the blue circles is essentially moved. Uh, so essentially, uh, each generated sample is being pushed, right, towards the nearest data example. And so this ensures that each generated sample has a nearby data example. 
But what it doesn't ensure is that ne each nearby, each data example actually has a nearby generated sample, right? So these two things are different, right? So uh, the former, right, in the GAN case, we're saying for each of the generated samples, we actually want to have a nearby data example. And so we can ha actually have, uh, you know, data examples are not essentially picked, right, by any of the generated samples. Whereas the, in the latter case, right, this is what we actually want is we actually want to uh, essentially, you know, take a look at this situation from the perspective of the data examples and say for each of the data examples, we actually want to have a general sample nearby, right? And that is, um, you know, uh, essentially what, um, you know, maximum likelihood uh, does, right? Um, and so uh, this is essentially why modes are being dropped, right? And how do we actually fix this? So let's just do it the other way around, right? So that is we want to have each data example pull the nearest generated sample towards it. And that is the idea behind our method, which is called implicit maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so any questions so far? A, yes. Okay, go ahead. Is it no. phenomenal because it's using one year's neighbor class, right? No. Okay, great question. Um, so think about what actually happens if you have a linear classifier, right? So if you have a linear classifier, all you're saying is, essentially, if you were to project right, every point right, and every sample onto a line, right, and then you're essentially finding a separating uh, boundary right, along the line. So essentially, right, a nearest neighbor classifier right, on the line is actually gonna be um, you know, similar to uh, a linear classifier, right, if you have uh, the two things uh, being linearly separable, right, so the two classes, the samples and the generated data. Um, and then what would actually happen in that case, right, so you would be basically saying, right, along the line I'm basically going to be doing this thing, right, and now the next iteration I'm going to have a different line, line right. Um, and then so you can imagine that over time, right, so the more linear projection directions you have, right, the more, the closer you get to basically this situation. Any other questions? Yes. I guess, uh, like, have you tried like, to test this conjecture by taking a warm start? But like, if you have a warm start, presumably uh -huh. for all data points, you're going to have something with a good probability close to it. Yeah, so it turns out that if you, even if you do a warm start, the same thing kind of happens. Like, so it, it did degenerates to this case, right? Because essentially, um, so unless uh, originally, um, so okay, so there are two things, right? So even if you have a model, right, that is already being uh, uh, fitted, right, to the data, right? Um, and then if you were to randomly sample from that model, right, you're still going to get points, right, that are not close to the real data. No, but okay, so right. imagine but then, a mixture of Gaussians with yes. not too many components. If yes. you have like a you know, warm start, presumably you're going to get at least one thing in each component, right? Like, so that should be... Oh yes, in the mixture of Gaussian case, yes. Um, that, that works. Uh, in the general case, uh, if you were to already say, uh, fit a model, right, that you know actually because, you know, if you actually know the generating procedure, for example, right, and then if you were to fit a general model based on that, right, so if you have the model that's exactly the ground truth generating, uh, generating process, uh, turns out that this thing still happens. Um, and that is because just due to the randomness in the gen gen um, in the, that's inherent in the general process, um, you're always going to get, uh, essentially data points, right, that are going to be far from what you actually observe. Um, and then that's essentially going to use the modeling power, right, to actually, you know, push all those, you know, samples, right, towards whatever the generated data points are, right, and that's going to take mass, right, probably mass away from the other regions. Okay, so let me talk about our method, which is known as implicit maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and there's going to be a justification for that name later on. Um, so again, we have a, uh, the same data set as before, right? So, um, so the, the red squares, again, just to remind you, are the real data examples. The blue circles are the generated samples. Now, the first step is we are going to, um, you know, uh, go over all the different data points, and then we're going to look around each data point and find the nearest <coughs> generated sample. And so uh, for these three data points, for example, uh, these are the three nearest uh, samples, right, to these data examples. And then we're going to optimize the parameters of the generator um, so that the samples are po uh, pulled towards the data examples. And we're gonna do that for all the different data examples simultaneously, 
And that's it, right? So it's very simple. Um, so here's the objective that we have, right? So um, let's try to parse this. So essentially, in the first step, we are going to take the minimum, right, over all the different uh, j's, where the j's are indexing over the z's, right? So the z's, again, here, uh, actually, okay, yeah, so the z's are here, right? So the z's are basically just uh, random vectors, right, sample from a Gaussian. And so basically what that is doing is you are going to be finding uh, the, uh, for the current data point yi, right, you're going to be finding the sample, right, that is the closest to yi. So that is what this minimum is doing. Um, and so now, of course, this involves high dimensional nearest neighbor search, right, because uh, simply because your yi and uh, what the generated samples could be in the high dimensional space, this used to be hard due to the curse of dimensionality, but I will, of course, talk about how to solve that later. Um, and so then you're going to average over all the real data examples, right? So this is going to go over all the different data examples, uh, yi's, right? And then you essentially take the average. And then finally, you're going to take the expectation over the generated samples, right? Um, and so, um, you know, this is just, uh, you know, so these are random variables, right? So you have to take expectation to just to marginalize these out. And of course, you just optimize over uh, using ordinary stochastic gradient descent, right? So you're just going to draw samples, right, that from a uh, standard Gaussian, and then you're just going to do uh, gradient descent, right, uh, in the primary space. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. I mean, this Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah. So it does turn out that okay. So the uh, different dissymmetric that we use in practice, right, is based on uh, essentially um, uh, semantic, uh, you know, semantic features, right. So if you take uh, you know the the upper layer features of a neural net and then compute distance in that uh, space. Um, it turns out that even if you were to use L2 space, you get reasonable results, right, which is actually kind of surprising. Uh, but then if you think about it, it's kind of less so um, because um, you know, this disymmetric is only essentially measuring what you, um, you know, uh, the disymmetric is only going to differ right, locally. Right? So if you, for example, have um, you know, very uh, different samples from the real data initially, right, basically any arbitrary disymmetric will actually make sure the two manifolds actually get close, um, you know, near each other. Uh, it's only when you are actually um, you know, already kind of very close, when the two are already close to coinciding, where the, uh, the distance metric is actually going to matter more. Any other questions? Yes. How do you choose M? Okay, great question. Um, so M essentially, um, we, okay, so in practice, right, we choose M by essentially making sure that um, you know, M is at least larger than the number of modes that you actually expect in the data. Um, so uh, in practice, we found that, you know, usually something in on the order of 50s or 20s would actually suffice for a lot of practical tasks. Um, but, you know, we are doing some theoretical analysis on how the M is actually going to affect the primary estimates. Okay, so. Uh, what is the connection to maximum likelihoods? Um, um, so here's the high level intuition. Um, so basically a model distribution that maximizes likelihoods right, should have high density at each of the data examples, right? just because likelihood is a product of the densities evaluated at the different data examples. So if you were to now sample from such a model, right, then you would more likely to lie near a data example than elsewhere. And so intuitively, Maxim likes is saying, right, we want to make sure that, you know, essentially around all the different data examples, right, we have similar samples. Um, here's um, um, a more uh, precise result that is still informal. Um, the, the actual theorem is found in the paper. Um, and so if the model is richly parameterized and the model density is smooth in both the parameters and your um, data, then essentially you can view um, uh, optimizing the proposed objective as maximizing a lower bound on the true uh, log likelihood. Um, and so um, this is a lower bound just because you have WIs here, right, that are uh, between, strictly between zero and one. 
And so what are these WIs? So these WIs uh, are essentially determined by uh, how richly parameterized your model is. And so the tightness of this band is going to depend on the gap uh, between uh, essentially the, the maximum likelihood solution, uh, the density of the maximum likelihood solution uh, evaluate over all the different data points. And then if you were to take a look at the gap between the minimum and the maximum, if those two quantities don't differ by much, then this bound is going to be tighter. And so how do you make sense of this? Uh, essentially, if you have a model that is richly parameterized and is actually expressive, um, so the maximum likelihood solution is going to favor uh, uh, parameters where uh, you have similar densities right, assigned to all the different data examples, um, just because if you were to have very dissimilar densities, then your likelihood is going to be low. And so the more expressive the model, the tighter this bounds actually becomes. Uh, of course, by uh, extension, uh, just because maximum li likelihood, the way a maximum objective actually works, um, it, because uh, essentially we're penalizing uh, uh, cases where the, the, uh, you have low density right, assigned to the different data points, we are going to be uh, you know, saying essentially we are disallowing mode collapse right? because this would actually give us a likelihood of zero and we are going to be favoring a case where we actually cover all the modes. Can I ask a quick question because I'm yes. not familiar with GAN. Okay. So theta I assume is doing the high dimensional Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's to stop in the right hand side mm -hmm. to just get a spike over every data point? Right. Why is it going to overfit naturally? Yes, okay, great question. Um, so basically, we're only going to be focusing on a particular fixed model class, right? So if we have a given model class, for example, that's a Gaussian, right, then you cannot actually uh, fit a, um, you cannot actually have a peak, right, over here. Data is really high dimensional, isn't it going to be a super rich? Family. If data is really high dimensional, it's going to be a very rich family, but it's not going to be discontinuous. So, so you cannot get a discontinuous density out of a model where you're feeding in yeah. continuous random variables and having a continuous map right on top of that. So theta is going to be not big O, it's going to be a little O-N or something like that, the dimension of theta. Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is in the parametric case, right? So in the non-parametric case, you will get like very different. Yes. So is so F is analogous to the generator. Is when you use D features for D, do you train D in tandem with F, or do you first train the discriminator and then train the generator? Oh, uh, okay. So in practice, okay, so you could do that. So that could be you know something you would do, right? If you know, for example, you want to actually train the metric, um, you know, um, jointly with the actual model. In our case, we did something simpler. So we actually just took a pre-trained um, neural net trained on some auxiliary task, and then we just used that. Um, turns out to work pretty well. Um, but of course, uh, you could think about you know, how to actually you know, train both simultaneously, and then that would probably give you adversarial formulation. Yeah, question. Yes. So, um, but your formulation of IMLE gets rid of, there's, there's no discriminator generator game going on, nothing like that. It's nothing like that. Write down this optimization problem solver. Yes. Right, yes. <laughs> Right, so that's one of the advantages I'm, that I'm going to talk about later on, right? So you don't get rid of the minimax uh, uh, formulation. Okay, so maximum likelihood versus GANs, right? So what are the big differences? Um, and so, uh, you know, in standard maximum likelihoods, right, that is, of course, uh, you know, equivalent to minimizing the forward KL, right? So that is minimizing the KL divergence from the model distribution to the data distribution, right? Um, and usually it's actually the empirical data distribution uh, in the sample-based setting. Um, and so intuitively, you know, this is assigning, assigning high penalty, right? If the low density, uh, high penalty, if you have a low density, right, assigned to any of the dense regions of the true data distribution, or in the empirical case, the actual observations. Uh, so, in the, so this is mode covering, right? So you want to basically make sure, right? So if this is the true data distribution, you want to cover all the different modes. 
So in the case of the GAN, uh, so various people have proposed that it's actually minimizing the reverse KL. Um, so there is a caveat to this. Um, I might talk about that uh, in a bit uh, if I have time. But basically, uh, it's minimizing the reverse KL, right? So it's minimizing the KL divergence from the true data distribution to the model distribution. Um, and so that is basically you know, what you can get, right? So you can basically uh, don't care, you may not actually care about assigning uh, you know, low density right, to, true, uh, true, uh, to uh, regions of the space where the true density is actually uh, small right, or, or, or actually high, uh, but it's actually going to give you a very high penalty if the opposite thing happens. Right? So if, for example, your model is generating something that is different from the true data distribution, then it's going to penalize it uh, significantly. And so, you know, this is the most seeking, right? Um, and so, you know, so basically the, the GAN versus maximum likelihood, you can basically think of it as reversing the roles, right, between the data and the model samples. There are other problems with GANs. Um, so we have mode collapse. Uh, we also have vanishing gradient sometimes, and we have training stability. Uh, and the training stability comes from this adversarial formulation, which can be only done heuristically. Um, and so, you know, an example of what could go wrong is something like this, right? So uh, these are essentially the updates you can perform, right, in the two coordinates, the coordinates, right, with the general parameters and the discriminator parameters. And then you may never actually get to the min-max solution, right, if you were to try to do uh, the standard uh, gradient ascent descent. Of course, because we don't have an adversarial formulation, we can get rid of this problem. Um, so, right, so we uh, overcome mode collapse, vanishing gradients, and training stability. And we don't have vanishing gradients, by the way, just because um, we, uh, so because we are measuring uh, the samples, uh, the distance between the samples and the real data by the distance, right, between those samples, rather than looking at the densities evaluated at the different uh, data points. Uh, the gradient is only going to become zero if the two uh, the two, essentially the data manifold and the model uh, are already uh, coinciding. Okay, so let me show some empirical results. So uh, yes? So, like, uh, what if m is really large? Like, if m is uh -huh. like order n or something like that, then... m is order n, okay. Do you have vanishing gradients? Yes, yes. In that case, you would, yes. So um, do you really need to keep m small? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if M is actually order N, then you could show a lower bound by essentially saying, uh, you know, what if you were to actually have um, all the different data points being matched to the samples in the, like, the wrong way. Um, so that is uh, certainly possible. Um, and then, yeah, so this is really kind of in, uh, in the parametric setting. Okay, so uh, let's show some, uh, take a look at some empirical results. Um, so if you were to take a look at the recall, for example, um, so this is again from that um, paper that did this empirical study. Um, and so these are the recall levels achieved by different variants of GANs. And this is the, the recall achieved by our methods. Um, so this is actually 100% recall. What that means is on the validation set, right, which the model has never seen, for every one of these, those examples, we can actually find a, uh, a, a Z, right, the latent variable, that actually gives us uh, arbitrary good reconstructions right, um, to the original data in the validation sets. Uh, that is not true for any of the GAN-based models. Okay, so we can also take a look at the F measure uh, achieved by the different models. So these are, again, the different GAN-based models. Um, and so you can see uh, on the horizontal axis is the hyperparameter tuning budget. So the more hyperparameter settings that you try, obviously the better the F measure is going to be. And F measure, by the way, is the um, harmonic mean between precision and recall. Um, and so this is the, the performance achieved by our method. So this is literally, uh, we haven't actually tried tuning hyperparameters. This is the first thing we tried. Um, and that is already beating all these other GAN-based methods uh, by a huge margin. Sorry, can I ask a question? Just yes. The previous slide. So did mm -hmm. you say that if I give you an arbitrary image, yes. you can find 
some value of z that maps arbitrarily close to an arbitrary yes. image. Yes. So this is on the synthetic data set I talk about. Yes. Find some value of z where it might be extremely unlikely. Right? So if I just have a Gaussian oh, sure. distribution yes. over sixty-four dimensional space, yes, you are initializing. Some yes, z that so yes, you are initializing at the center, and you are uh, finding the z by gradient descent. Yeah, so he's asking something, some, something slightly different, right? Like he's asking, you can find it, but what's its likelihood under? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so okay, so I guess my answer is basically saying you're always going to be performing local <laughs> updates, right? So uh, just because uh, gradient descent, so you're never actually going to find something that is very far, and we did actually check this. Um, so you could alternatively also actually impose a penalty, right, it's depending on the density of the Gaussian distribution, right? And then actually were to, if you were to do that, you can still get the same result. Right, so I still have a question with the claim. Like suppose mm -hmm. f theta is ident the identity function. Okay. I pass in Gaussian noise and my output is Gaussian noise. Yes. Then that answer for every image that you give me in 64 dimensional mm -hmm. space, there is some value of z that is arbitrarily close to that image. I mean, because the Gaussian distribution assigns mass everywhere in the space. So I oh, sure. Some yes. Value yes. That is so that's your yes, let that's me your qualify. Yeah, let me qualify that. So I'm qualifying it by saying you can find the z that is close to the, to the origin. Right. That is close to the origin, yes. So, so that is what I'm saying. So if you were to have another term right, in the optimization that basically uh, that is the, uh, the Gaussian density, right, uh, center at zero, then you can still solve that uh, where um, the objective value is uh, not going to be um, extremely large, for example, or small, rather. Can I ask you something? Yes. You said that this, the reconstruction is arbitrarily close. Yes. I think the whole point of GANS is to define a distance symmetry. Right? Yes. We know that if we take L2 between two images, the, the image that has the lowest L2 okay, right. will not be a good image. I think yes. the whole point of having discriminators is to allow us to say, yeah, that image is lower than right. it is. I think that's the golden thing. And you cannot just say, yes. that's, that's the most important thing. And you say, oh, I'm going to portray some features right. and dump them there to give me the... I mean, okay, so, so if you are saying, okay, so you could say, for example, right, so, you know, so if the, the images are 64 by 64, and then if I say, you know, that this metric is going to achieve something that's, you know, even less than the pixels difference, right, so if, you know, every pixel is going to be from zero to one, and then if the distance is going to be less than one, right, then in that case, you know, if the distance is less than one, right, regardless of the distance metric, then you know, basically, you know, it's going to differ by at most a pixel, right, the two images. Correct. And then, you know, that is already close, right? So, so it's, it's an, if you're sufficiently local, right, then the distance metric doesn't actually matter but, that but much. But how can we then evaluate the interpolation capability? Yeah. Uh, we are yes. copying and right. pasting essentially the training samples. Oh, this is on the validation set. Uh, this is on the validation, validation set. Like new images. New images if you've never seen before. Right. How about like an even dumber test? Like let's suppose you take a low-dimensional mixture of Gaussian something, okay. and train your model, yes. and then take samples from it. It's low-dimensional, so you can see what the distribution looks like. Uh -huh. it looks like. Does it kind of look like the mixture you were trying to learn? Yeah, yeah, that does. Yeah, we did check that. Um, and that turns out to be a simple, relatively simple task. Um, and then some people argue that it is almost too simple uh, because uh, Basically, you can get away with, uh, okay, so if you're, all you're trying to do is to find kind of where the different modes are, right, then you could just essentially simulate a bunch of samples everywhere, right, and then essentially just, um, uh, okay, so essentially the argument is these, this objective is naturally suited to that particular task. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so here are some more interesting examples on real images. <laughs> um, so, okay, so this is on uh, the task of super resolution where we're trying to essentially predict a high resolution image from a low resolution input. And so uh, here uh, we feed in this input, right? So this is upsampling by a factor of eight, which is uh, essentially increasing number of pixels by a factor of 64. So if we feed in uh, input like this, then these are the different samples that we get from our model, as you can see. Uh, these different images right, are all uh, consistent with the input image and all are also plausible. 
And so in contrast, so this is what, uh, so SR GAN st uh, stands for super resolution uh, GAN. Um, and so that is a GAN based model that is optimized for the task of super resolution. And then you can see that um, you can only get a single sample, right? Uh, regardless of how you vary the input latent variable. And that is, uh, you know, exhibiting, uh, you know, mode collapse, right? Um, and so you can also take a look at um, the difference, uh, essentially taking the different samples and then computing the mean and the standard deviation. And so what's interesting here is that if you take a look at the standard deviation, right, you, this is uh, uh, essentially showing you where the model is most uncertain, right? So it is most uncertain around the edges of the wings, right? And so you get a very high variability here, whereas you don't get a lot of variability here, which makes sense. We can also take a look at a different example where we're trying to go from uh, this input semantic segmentation map right, that shows you essentially what the scene looks like or how the scene is laid out. Uh, and then we're trying to essentially generate different images right, from the same semantic segmentation map. Again, you can see for our methods, we can get uh, very different and diverse samples right, for the same input scene layout. Um, and so you can see uh, the different images are all plausible and consistent with the input image, and they reflect changes in the uh, times of the day or lighting conditions. Um, whereas for, uh, for this method, right, which is based on the GAN, um, this pixel to a pixel HD, um, and so that is always going to give you the exact same uh, uh, image, right? Um, exact same sample, regardless of how you vary the input latent variable. You can also take a look at how the uh, it's going to look right as you interpolate in the latent space set, right? So, um, you know, just because now we can actually have a conditional model that doesn't ignore the input latent variable, you can actually check right and see what the different points actually look like, and then here you can see, um, you know, by interpolating in the space, you get smooth changes, right? Uh, you know, between different plausible images that are all uh, sensible. So this is a different experiment where we are actually taking a look at what happens, right, if we were to feed in different inputs, right? So this is essentially different conditional distributions, right, condition on different input semantic segmentation maps. But now we're going to feed in the same latent variable, right, across all, all these different uh, scene layouts and see what actually happens. And then you see there's this uh, consistency, right, across the different images. Um, so, you know, so this suggests that essentially it discovers some sort of uh, latent semantic structure, right, that is common across all the different uh, inputs that, uh, you know, we feed in. We can also use it to generate uh, essentially evolving outputs, right, as we change the input scene layout. So this is essentially generated by using the same Z, right, and then actually feeding in this uh, continuous sequence of frames where we vary the position of the car. And so here you can see for our method, you can get a smooth video out, right? Whereas for a GAN based method, pix to pix, um, you get this sort of flickering. Uh, and this is because at different um, time step, the, the GAN could be actually just arbitrarily picking a different mode of the data distribution. And so you can have, uh, you don't really have this sort of notion of consistency across the different inputs. Whereas for our method, we can do so just by uh, feeding in the same latent variable. We can also take a look at what uh, happens when we do unconditional image synthesis. So this is just uh, not taking in any input and then just generating images. Um, and so these are uh, essentially uh, you know, the results that you get with uh, our method combined with Glow. Uh, and so uh, this is the, the vanilla Glow and Clan and, so, and uh, the GAN. And so you can see that uh, there's an uh, improvement in the sample quality. <laughs> And so this is the same model trained on faces, and then you can, of course, also see that you have smooth interpolations uh, from the different, uh, between the different faces. And finally, this is the most uh, interesting uh, figure, I think. Um, and so what this shows is the precision and recall of the actually, so uh, different variants of GANs and the VAE. Um, so in this figure, uh, each dot actually represents a GAN or VAE at one particular hyperparameter setting. 
There are a hundred different hyperparameter settings for each GAN. So there are seven different GAN variants and one AE, so the one VAE. So there are 800, uh, 800 different dots in this picture. Um, and this shows you that our single model, right? So that is our model is the star here, is outperforming, right? All these other models on both recall and precision. And the same is true on a different data set. Okay, so that is the first part about nearest or uh, general models. Uh, any questions so far? So, yes. So this looks uh, great. Uh, okay. I was wondering regarding the evaluation of generative models. Yes. If you argue that it's difficult and so on. Yes. Would you like to comment a little bit on the precision recall curve and what? Yes. Yes. Um, so in the precision recall setting, uh, I think it is a good metric in that uh, we do explicitly decompose the precision from the recall. There is a caveat in that uh, the recall and the precision that are measured, especially precision, isn't necessarily um, precision in the traditional sense, right? So because, uh, so this is computed on uh, essentially a, a fixed data set, right, where you don't actually know the generating process. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's actually just um, saying, you know, so we generate a bunch of images and take a look, you know, how close they are to, to one of the data examples that we have collected, right? So it is, uh, you know, it is, uh, lower bounds, right, on true precision. So, so you know, there's that issue there, but then, you know, um, it is a lot better than kind of, you know, what people are used to, right, like FID or, um, you know, inception scores, they're just single numbers, right, that basically uh, try to combine both for precision and recall, but it's not clear essentially how they're actually doing the combination. And an image in your validation set is assumed detected if the reconstruction uh, distance is below Yes, yes, mm -hmm, right. And it turns out that the rankings don't change as you vary the threshold. So if you vary the threshold, then you know, all the numbers are either going to get lower or higher, right? But then the rankings between the different methods don't really change. Okay, so let me uh, quickly talk about nearest neighbor search. Um, so, okay, obviously it arises in a lot of different settings. Um, and so, you know, let me just skip through this. So this is basically just uh, you know what you know what the nearest neighbor search problem is about. Um, so how do we actually find the nearest neighbors? Um, so there's this naive algorithm that you can consider, right? So you can compute the distance from the query to each of the data points, sort the distances, and then just take the top k. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that the time complexity is actually linear in the number of data points, so it's too computationally expensive when the data set is large, and so can we actually come up with a smarter way that avoids going over all the data points? And this has been you know, worked on for a long, long time, uh, starting all the way back uh, in 1975 when the KD tree was proposed, all the way up to today. Um, and so this is actually, even though it's a long list, it's actually not exhaustive. Um, so let me talk about the two different notions of dimensionality that could define the hardness of the problem. Um, there is ambient dimensionality. So that is the dimensionality of the space uh, where the data points live, right? Um, and then there's also intrinsic dimensionality. Um, and so this is essentially, the, 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 you can roughly think of it as a dimensionality of the manifold that generate all the, the, the data points. And so the uh, curse of dimensionality just refers to one of two things, right? So either you have uh, exponential dependence on the ambient dimensionality or exponential dependence on the intrinsic dimensionality in the running time. And so early algorithms do suffer from the curse of ambient dimensionality. So if you think about KD trees, for example, uh, you know, if you take a look at the running time, worst case is going to be exponential in the ambient dimensionality. Uh, later on, uh, so by just doing randomization, you can show that you no longer have this issue. But the curse of intrinsic dimensionality is still a problem, uh, even for randomized algorithms, right? So, you know, they aren't able to overcome the curse of intrinsic dimensionality by simple randomization. And we'll take a look at why that is the case. Okay, curse of intrinsic dimensionality. This is a picture that shows you the query times of all the different uh, prior methods. Uh, so um, why does this actually happen? So let's think about the definition of intrinsic dimensionality. So if you have a data set with the intrinsic dimensionality of d prime, and we, if we were to consider an arbitrary ball with sufficiently many points, 
then if we were to double the radius of this ball, then the number of points inside the ball is going to grow by at most a factor of two to the d prime, right? So uh, d prime is really this, uh, this log growth, right, in the number of data points uh, as the, the, the radius of the ball grows. Um, and this is also known as the expansion dimension sometimes, or the KR dimension. Okay, so let's take a look at a few examples just to illustrate what this means, right? So if we have a uniform grid, and then uh, if we take a look at the ambient and the intrinsic dimensionalities, they will be this, both the same in this case, um, so they will both be two. But if we were to take that same set of points and embed them in uh, 3D, now the ambient will be three, but the intrinsic will remain two, um, and hence the name. So existing algorithms use this method called space partitioning. Um, so these are uh, three different popular methods, KD trees, LSH, and RP trees. And they're all based on the idea of dividing up the space into discrete cells. Now, how does it work? Um, so this is a KD tree, for example. So uh, first, we're going, if we're now given a query that's denoted by the first square, we're going to look uh, in the data structure and find the cell that contains the query. And then we're going to retrieve the points that lie in the cell. And sometimes we will also go up the tree and like, take a look at the neighboring cells as well. Um, and so finally, we would do a naive exhaustive search over the subset of data points right, that are in these cells. Now, why do we actually have the curse of entrance and dimensionality? If we were to consider any cell in the data independent partitioning scheme, um, and so this is uh, shown uh, as the cube here, and uh, you know, it could be of any arbitrary shape, this is just for simplicity. Um, now, uh, if we were to have an intrinsic dimensionality of one, and if we were to count the number of points right within the cell, we have two points. Now, if the intrinsic dimensionality goes up to two, right, we have four points. Now, if it goes up to three, we have eight points, right? So now, obviously, you see this exponential growth happening, right? So it went from two to four to eight, right? And so as the intrinsic dimensionality increases, the number, number of points within the cell is going to grow exponentially. And this seems discouraging because it essentially shows you that regardless of the partitioning scheme, you will always have an exponential dependence in the running time. Nevertheless, can we somehow hope to overcome the exponential dependence on the intrinsic dimensionality? And it turns out that it is actually possible. So this is what our method is able to achieve. Um, so this is actually sublinear growth in the intrinsic dimensionality. And this is a later uh, method that we developed that achieves even better dependence. So the contribution is uh, really um, you know, a development of an algorithm that is uh, you know, for the first time, sublinear in the uh, curse of uh, sublinear in the uh, ambient energy system, or, or sublinear the, in the number of data points, and that can overcome the curse of ambient and interest and dimensionalities. Okay, um, so what's the key insights? Um, so if we recall the previous picture, right, so essentially, um, you know, it shows you that as the intrinsic dimensionality increase, the number of points is always going to grow exponentially regardless of how you divide up the space. Uh, so that just means we cannot actually divide up the space, right? So what do we do instead? So one thing we could do is to just project all the different data points along the line. Uh, and this is a random line, and then we can essentially search along this direction. And so, but let's think about whether this is enough. So if we were to think about a fixed neighborhood right on this line, and then let's think about right, how many uh, points are actually going to lie at this interval right, as the entrance dimensionality increases. So if it's one, we're just gonna get one point. If it's two, we're gonna get four points. If it's three, we're going to get 10 points, actually. So now, of course, think about this sequence of numbers. Again, looks like exponential growth, right? So, and it is, right? So the number of points within the interval is still going to grow exponentially. So this is not very useful. Um, so we really need to step back and think about a different way of doing things, right? So do we really need to pick an interval at all, right? That's in data independent. Um, now, so what do we actually need to return the right nearest neighbor? Um, so let's think about the query now. So this is the query and this is the true nearest neighbor. And let's think about where they actually project to on this line. So this is uh, a blow up right, of this, uh, this part here. Um, that is where the query projects to. That's where the nearest neighbor projects to. 
And now what if we were to just count the number of points right, along the projection line, right, starting from the projection uh, of the query. So what do I mean by that? So if we were to start from here and then uh, think about the point that projects closest right, to the query, right, that is this point here. The second closest one is this one, and the third closest one is this one, right? So this sh uh, shows that in this particular case, uh, within three points, we're able to retrieve the right nearest neighbor. And it turns out that in general, the nearest neighbor must be among the first uh, O of n to the one minus one over d prime points with high probability. And so uh, n here is the number of data points. And so this is a picture that shows you what this function looks like. And so this essentially shows that as the interest in dimensionality grows, you get some linear growth right, in, the, uh, in this function. Okay, so how does our algorithm work? Uh, let me see, I may not actually have a lot of time for this. Um, okay, so let me just skip through this quickly. Um, so basically what we do is uh, we are going to project all the different data points along the different projection directions, right? So uh, these two, uh, in this case, we just have two projection directions. In general, we can have more. And so what do we do? So we are going to project the query right along this, uh, these two different projection directions. And then we're just going to march along the two different projection directions. So what do I mean by that? So first we're going to find the closest point to the query along this projection direction. We're going to do the same along this other one. And then we're going to compare the projected distances to the query, right? So uh, you know, that is projected distance from the query to the closest data points along this line. That is the same along this line. And we're going to pick the points uh, that we're uh, currently considering, uh, uh, you know, that has the shortest projected distance, right, among kind of all the different things that we, we have currently. Uh, and this happens to be this, uh, this point over here. And now, so we're going to, for each of the, uh, the, for each query, we're going to maintain always a hash table uh, for the number of points that we actually have come across a data point. And these are the different counts that we have currently, right? We haven't ever uh, seen any of the data points, uh, uh, you know, yet. Uh, but because, uh, you know, this is the point we're going to visit, we're going to increment the counter, right, for this data point here to one. And then we're going to repeat, right? So next iteration, we're going to find the second closest data point, right, along this projection direction. Uh, take a look at the projected distances uh, and then compare that to, to this projected distance and see which one is the shorter one. Again, it happens to be this point here that has the shorter projected distance. We're then gonna take a look at the points along, uh, you know, this direction here, right? So this is the, you know, we've seen this point another time, or, uh, uh, you know, we, we're going to increment the counter for this data point. And then we're going to repeat, right? So uh, let's see. So at some point we are going to have a data point like this. So this is a data point um, that has been seen already along a projection direction, and then we're just coming across that point a second time. Now, um, so this is now um, uh, intuitively close, right, to the query along all the different projection directions. And so we are going to declare this to be a candidate point, right, because the point that is close to all the, uh, to the query along all the different projection directions are likely going to be actually near the, the query. Um, just because the initially the projection directions are selected uh, independently. Um, and so we are going to you know, keep track of all these points that we have seen along all the different projection directions. And then finally, at the end of the algorithm, if we have sufficiently many right, of these uh, different candidate points, we're going to terminate and then just return the k closest points right, uh, in that set. So what is the intuition? So basically points are always added to the candidate sets, right, in the order of their maximum projected distance to the query where the maximum is taken over the different projection directions, right? So this is because uh, essentially if you take a look at the order in which points are visited along a single projection direction, you're always going to be visiting them in the order of the projected distance. And now because you will be waiting, right, to see 
eight points, right, along all the different projections, uh, directions before you add it to the candidate set, you are essentially taking the maximum, right, over all the different projection uh, directions. So the maximum projected distance is the lower bound on the true distance, and so as the number of projection directions increases, then this uh, lower bound is going to become tighter and then it's going to approach the true distance. What is the complexity of our algorithm? Uh, and this is the key highlight. Um, and so here, uh, what's important is this term here, right? So this thing is going to dominate if uh, uh, your, uh, the number of data points is going to dominate your uh, dimensionality and the interest in dimensionality. Um, and so what this shows is that we have a linear dependence on the ambient dimensionality, right? So, and we also have a sublinear dependence on the entrance dimensionality, right? In particular, the dependence on either, either of those uh, things uh, is not exponential, right? Um, and that is, uh, you know, shows you that we don't actually have the curse of ambient or entrance dimensionality. The space complexity is also good because it's linear in the number of data points. Um, and that is, uh, you know, for example, if you compare that to LSH, uh, and if you want to have a high approximation quality, it actually requires a near quadratic uh, dependence on the, uh, on the data set size. Um, and so this is a lot more space efficient than LSH. Um, you can also insert and delete points uh, easily without reconstructing the data structure. Um, and this is different from a lot of the prior methods where, uh, for example, as you're inserting points, you may have this worst case situation of, you know, a lot of data points lying in a particular cell, right? And that basically just um, going to violate your uh, running time guarantee. We, no longer, we don't really have this issue uh, because we are never uh, dividing up the space. Okay, let's take a look at experiments. Um, so, um, here are uh, uh, some experimental re results on CIFAR 100. So on CIFAR 100, we're able to achieve a 14 times speed up compared to LSH. So this is LSH, this is our methods. Uh, MNIS is even more drastic, so we're able to achieve a 100 times 16 uh, reduction uh, uh, compared to LSH. And here's a blow up of that picture, right? So our method is down here, LSH is all the way up there. Uh, space efficiency is, uh, you know, at least 20 times uh, less space than LSH. Um, same thing for MNIST, basically. And so that concludes my talk. Um, and now I'd be happy to take your questions. And also feel free to check out my website for more details and uh, my Twitter account, uh, if you guys are interested. <laughs> Right. Uh, unit vector u over all unit vectors u. Can yes. Can you use this kind of dual representation yes. of that two norm? Yes. So can you do this for other distance metrics which don't have that dual representation? Right. So in general, this is not always possible, right? Um, and then there are actually lower bounds uh, in the case of the Hamming uh, distance, right? So you know, and then you cannot, and this would violate the, the lower bound if you were to able to do that for the ham, if you could do that for the having distance, right? So uh, in general, it's not possible, right? Uh, for uh, distance metrics like L1, you know, you could do it, right? Um, you know, for, um, yeah, I mean, you really need to take a look at it on a case by case basis. Right. Um, yeah, so that is ongoing, yes. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, ideally we do like to, uh, you know, I mean, generating images is cool, um, but, you know, it's really kind of, you know, only looking at a very limited setting, right? And then, to be honest, it's a setting where probably models may not be that actually, you know, the most useful. Um, so we are actually looking at uh, applications where, for example, um, you know, you would actually care about the uncertainty, right? And then that usually involves um, kind of non-image synthesis applications. Um, so that is certainly something we're working on. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs>
You could, yes. In this case, if you, yeah, so I mean the point here is if you have a, a model that's able to capture all the different modes of the underlying data distribution, right, then if you were to sample from that model that actually that gives you a good uncertainty estimates, right, if on the other hand you have a model that actually collapses a lot of the modes, then it's actually going to underestimate the uncertainty the model has, which is not good. Oh, thank you.